I am honestly the luckiest human alive because at a very early age, I realized what it was that gave me deep, satiating joy, a real connection with the very life force that moves me. And you can call that cheesy or corny or whatever you want, but it's true. When I set foot on a stage, when I step on a set, when I go through the Paramount gates, when I go to CBS Radford or Fox or Warner Brothers, something happens to me. I turn eight years old and I remember every inspiration. I remember the first time my dad showed me the court jester and how it felt to want to be Danny Kaye. It's imprinted in my cellular DNA. And so I'm lucky, you know, that I, that I knew I wanted to do it, that I had the support to do it, and then that I got lucky enough to be able to continually do it. And I say this with a real understanding of how fortunate I am, but I've never held another job. I've only ever been an actor. And I wear that like a badge of honor. Filmmaker Magazine presents Back to One with Peter Rinaldi. Christy Amantopoulos is an actor. He sat down with me in cyberspace to talk about the work. Is there like a typical way that you like to begin to kind of wrap your arms around how to play a new character? You know, it's funny. I think in the beginning of my career, I, I wouldn't have necessarily had a definitive answer. It might have varied from character to character or from genre to genre, or it would have, it maybe might have been um, impacted by whether it was a, a stage role or a, a sitcom or a drama. But I think that I found that there is a connective tissue for me with regard to all my roles that maybe started out unconsciously and then, and then I realized it's very conscious. and. Uh, for some reason, I have to hone in on the character's voice before any of it can make any sense to me. If I understand how they speak, and that's to say not necessarily with regard to any regionalism or accent, mm. but even just the notion of of how their of what their cadence would be based on the based on their energy level, what what their tempo would be. It all really begins with what aspects of the voice allow me to sort of find that that, that idiosyncratic combination that once I can hone in on it, once I know how that human being speaks, then that informs how I carry myself, then the road sort of unveils itself before me, as it were. Is it just a coincidence, though, that you happen to be so amazing with voices? Do you know what I mean? Or, or, is, or is that coming after that? Or is that coming because you have this interest? From a very early age, from as early as I can remember being entertained by actors, I can also remember how I was affected by various elements of my favorite actors' voices and the way that they delivered lines, things yeah. that stuck in my head, uh, things that I remembered. And I realized pretty early on that I had a knack for mimicry. And it was mimicry that sort of led me to realize that it was acting that I was actually seeking out. You know, at first it was just making fun with voices and imitating people and making my friends and family laugh. And then I realized that it wasn't just the mechanical facility of being able to, you know, embody someone well enough for a few minutes to, to elicit, uh, you know, a happy response. It was the notion of how it felt for me to temporarily not be me and to be somebody else. Because the best imitations that I did, or certainly the ones that were the most effective, seemed to be a result of a complete shift in my character. It wasn't just me doing someone's voice. But I would often have people say, wow, you just looked like so-and-so. Mm -hmm. And it was because in order to sound like them, I had to be them. And yeah. that was what really became interesting to me and, and has remained interesting to me. It's, you know, some of my favorite actors, I don't really know what they're like at all. Uh, they, they disappear so much into the characters they're portraying that I'm left 
wondering what the actor's like. And that, to me, is intriguing. And uh, uh, and I, I, it's funny, after 36 years, oh my God, 37 years of doing this professionally, I, I can earnestly say I still fucking love acting. I'm always fascinated with people that have had a lot of stage experience when they were young. It feels like that is such a great foundation for no matter what aspect of acting that they happen to go into, even if they never go on the stage again. Can you just talk about what that is? Not, not about at that time. I'm talking about, is that still paying dividends for you now? Yes, without question it is. I mean, there's something about that, you know, the 10,000 hour rule that we've heard before so many times, but there's something about doing something over and over and over again. And I don't mean just singing songs or saying words or, 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 or you know, trotting the stage. It's, it's communion with an audience, communion with your fellow actor. It's the, the, the sense of collaboration, doing that over and over again. You know, I started out in, you know, school theater and then quickly realized that that wasn't enough and did every amateur and community theater production there was, and that wasn't enough, and then got into sort of low-level professional things before very quickly finding myself on Broadway. And none of it can work unless everybody is operating at at their best level, right? You know, and that, that really, it goes for, it goes for television and film as well, with the slight caveat that in those instances, in TV and film that is, you can take a pause and get people to where they need to be in order that, so that you may carry on. You can't do that in the theater. In the theater, we're in it together. There's really not a lot of room for, I mean, and you hear, you know, diva stories and stuff like that, but there really isn't a lot of room for, for, the, for, for uh, extravagant vanity, I guess, especially when you're a young actor starting out. You, you just have to, you have to be all in or you, or you, or you can't be in. That, 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 and that's really what's stayed with me. What stayed with me was you're either going to do all the work because that's what you have to do or you're, not go you're, or, you're, or you're not going to get what you want out of it. Even if you think that you've gotten what you want out of it, if you're not doing all the work, it's not going to satisfy you, which is why there are so many successful dissatisfied actors, I think. Over the past few years, I've had the pleasure of becoming um, very friendly with uh, someone that I consider and I say this without a shred of insincerity, the, the sort of the guiding star or sort of like uh, patron saint of what I think an actor really should navigate towards. And that's Brian Cranston. And his sense of duty as a performer, as an actor, is it's humbling and it's eye-opening and it's... Um, it's like a credo, like a, like a call to arms that reminds me that, you know, you can choose to look at this, oh, it's all silly, it's just acting, whatever, or you can say, this is a privilege to be able to entertain and to tell stories, to move and transport people. And um, yeah, I, I've, I've learned so much from Brian, even just having coffee with him. We really need those patron saints of of different arts, don't we? I mean, they they in in the in the trying times we can think of them as having their head on it right. You know what I mean? Because because usually it's at a moment when we're when we're not when we're spiraling, and you know, and I, so I, that's amazing to hear that of of that guy. And I've heard it from other people. I've I've heard it from people that just spent a, a, a moment with him that they he's, keep talking about it. He's just. Uh, I, I think I don't, if you have an opportunity, you should read his book too, A, a Life in Parts. Have you read it? I, I haven't, and I'm embarrassed to say I haven't. No, so no, many it's, have told me it, it, it. it really begs a read, um, and it reads while it's very entertainingly autobiographical, and while it's very um, scholastically sound in terms of uh, a sort of compendium of tales for an actor. I, I think it reads more like. Um, do you read Andre Agassi's Open? 
No, that's another yeah. one. That's my favorite athlete of all time. No, so if that's your favorite athlete, you got to read that book. That, 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 that's <laughs> yes. a, that, that's, so I think those two books should go on your on your list because yeah, I you. think Brian's book is, is an analogous to that in the sense that he takes you on a journey, just like he does as an actor, just like he did as as Walter White, just like he does in everything mm. he does. He takes you on this journey, and you trust that some of the, the stories where you're like, wait, where, where is this going? You, you just you trust that if it's being told, if he's showing it to you, there's a reason. And he has such a great, almost mm. Seinfeldian, pun intended, way oh, yeah. of, of drawing back to certain things. Um, mm. You know, I think we've, we've been sort of blessed with him as a, as a performer. And I think that, that the, the, the second act of, of his career as a storyteller, as a producer, as a writer, as a director, uh, I, I think that's going to be a very, very compelling next chapter for him as well. But I don't want to see him stopping acting anytime soon. Right. I just right. hope to have the privilege one day to do it with him. The night before your first day on a set, you're prepared, I'm, I'm sure of it, beyond, beyond belief. But what are you worried about? Are you worried about the environment of the set? Are you worried about, are you going to be given the tools that you need? Uh, and you can talk about what those might be. Do you need a happy set? Do you need a quiet set? Is this stuff, is this the stuff you're worried about? Or is there other stuff? And if you could talk about that. I'm actually going to set tomorrow on a, on a, a new project. Wow. Interesting. And um, the thoughts about what the day is going to be do vary from project to project based on what my um, level of participation is going to be, meaning am I a key player? Am I number one or two on the call sheet? Um, am I coming in as a facilitator? And, and what I mean by that is, the level of preparation, if I'm the lead of something, is, is, is going to be far more extensive and it almost won't even feel like a first day of shooting because I'll have done so much prep work with directors, with the writer, with producers, you know, uh, figuring out so much before we get to the first day of shooting. When I'm, you know, a, a gun for hire, a guest star or, or a, a single scene or you know, uh, uh, multiple scene in, in something that's established, it's sort of a different, uh, a different approach to it. It's also a different approach depending on what I'm called to do, what I'm called to be. If, if, it's, if it's a big, dynamic, broad comedy, I, I have to really sort of make sure that I understand uh, uh, what the tone of the piece is and, and to definitely know my material inside out and backwards so that I can feel facile with the words and if they want me to play and improvise then to know that I understand at least which way the scene is going on this piece tomorrow it's a it's a period piece and so part of my preparation for that was after I did my audition and I should say that you know a lot of the preparation goes into the audition I've made a ton of choices at that point I've memorized lines mm -hmm. I've established a character and then I get the job yeah so the job is now gotten. I've done a lot of the work, mm -hmm. which means I can relax a little bit and be completely lucid and free on set. Mm -hmm. Now, that is to say, provided I feel like I'm going to have all the tools that I need to fully get into character. And yes. when I make an audition, I'm in control of where the camera is, how the lighting is and what I look like so that I can give them just enough of what they need to hire me. When I show up on set, I'm fully exposed. I've got a crew all around me. I've got cameras usually in front of me, several actors that I've probably not worked with near me, and a lot of cooks usually in the kitchen that have a lot of different ideas as to how they want things to go. Mm -hmm. So in order for me to feel fortified, I have to make sure that I am fully secure as the character. And, and, and in this instance, I felt like the character needed some physical um, uh, supplements to make me feel a little bit more period appropriate. It's a, it's a 70s piece. And I didn't think my hair was quite right. So uh, I had a conversation with them that I knew I had a, about three weeks. So I started growing out my sideburns. Uh, and I met with a wig maker to, to make a wig because it just didn't seem in keeping that the character, particularly what he does for a living, wouldn't have longer hair. He would almost 99.9% .9 of the time have longer hair. The wigs can be tricky, but they can also really be helpful for an actor um, because uh, a, a wig, particularly in a piece that takes place in an era where there is sort of this very prototypical look, it just, the minute I look in the mirror, the minute I feel that hair, it, it's mm. going to take me somewhere. Yeah. Um, 
And so that was key for me before I set foot on on to set so that when I do set foot on to set that there's just because you know there can be times where a producer or a writer or a director isn't quite sure why something isn't working and it could be the simplest thing you know it could be because the sh the shirt on the actor just doesn't look right yeah. and it takes them out of it takes them out of the scene but if they don't communicate that correctly or if they don't actually realize it themselves what they communicate to the actor can be devastating right. and, and 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 it can be devastating not just to the actor but it can be devastating to the scene to the production you know yes. i mean what a lot of directors and producers and writers don't realize is that I don't care who the actor is, when they're on set, they're a just prepubescent 12 year old. Mm. And there's no way around it. Mm. I don't give a fuck what award they've won or how much they've worked, how much Shakespeare they've done. Or There is an innate, intrinsic, deep rooted, deep seated insecurity that the good actors recognize and work with and around, and they hone their skills to make sure that that doesn't come out in a way that's detrimental to the project or to themselves or to the character. But many actors are so fragile in that space, particularly if they're starting on a new project or, or if it's an important project or, 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 or for a number of different reasons, that if, if a, a moment of uncertainty is expressed in their direction, uh, then, then, you know, there are some directors who believe that getting an actor to that place of insecurity actually will elicit a natural response that could be fascinating to capture. I'm not entirely positive about that. I mean, I had the pleasure of working with with um, with David Fincher on, on, a, on a on a series for HBO, and I, I had heard some. You know, you, I'm sure many people have heard so many different stories about David Fincher. Uh, the experience that I had was actually phenomenal. It was thrilling. Um, and what I noted was that he liked the character work to begin well before the scene started its filming. And so I, I noted that that, that that he was keen on getting actors into character and into the scene, even as lighting was being set up, even as things were being put into position, so that as action was sort of either called or not even called, things were already oiled and moving. And I found tremendous value in that. Mm -hmm. Only in the sense, and that can only work really for a director, I think, like David Fincher, who has almost a Mozart-like understanding of what the finished symphony is going to be, right? right. Um, but I think, uh, in general, if I know my lines, if I know the script inside out and backwards, and I understand what the piece is, and what my position is, what, what, what my role in the, in the fruit salad is, um, then I can sleep well that night and it doesn't matter if I show up on a hostile set or a happy set. I, I prefer to have an impact on what the tone of the set's gonna be by being number one or number two because I like to set a peaceful and collaborative tone. And I do believe it comes down from number one. And I've had the privilege of working with some phenomenal number ones. I mean, I got to do a movie with Kurt Russell a few years ago, and I got to see what it really means to be a movie star. Meaning that when you open your eyes and and in, in, in the morning and, and your phone rings and your, and your driver's downstairs, you're a movie star the minute you answer the phone and the front desk is telling you that your car is waiting and you're a movie star until you get back in and, and close your door and, and, and get yourself ready for the next day. And that's Kurt. You know, there, there wasn't a, a person on set that wasn't happy to see Kurt and who wasn't lifted by his ebullience. And I think a lot of that just comes, I think he knows that he's fortunate. I think he also recognizes how to meter his energy. I've got three weeks to do this shoot. I'm here for three weeks. I'm nowhere else. I'm right here. Right. And it's like you make the decision, you make the commitment that you're going to do the job and that's where you are. And you are that way with catering and you are that way with the driver and you are that way with the DP and you're that way with the gaffer and you're that way with your fellow actors. You are there. And I love that. And, and I think a lot of the actors that I enjoy working with, like Dwayne Johnson and, and Kevin Hart, they're they're exactly like that. Sean Hayes is like that. Just this notion of I made this choice weeks ago. So there isn't something that's going to impact some sort of a a diva fit or a, a disgruntled, you know, it's not because it's not happening right now. I said yes to this weeks or months ago, 
And so the, the yes has already filtered through my body. I am here in body and soul. Let's do it. And I love that because why do something unless you're fully going to do it? Um, so yeah, for, for, for me, for example, tomorrow, know the lines. I know that there'll be, uh, I'm going to get it to set a little early uh, to do an extra wardrobe fitting, to try the wig on, make sure it looks good. I have already sort of an emotional contingency for if the wig looks ridiculous. If for some reason it doesn't work, let's just say it just didn't work out. I already know how I can pitch it to myself to mess with my hair, to make it feel fine so that there's no, you know, no issue. I, I, my main objective, other than doing my role exactly as it's meant to be, is to make sure that I answer far more problems than I present. And that's mm -hmm. not to say that I'm just trying to be a peacekeeper. I mean, the whole notion of what we're doing is trying to make this project come together. Now, there are some questions that are constructive, right? You wanna ask the right questions to make the project come together in the most creative way. But there are times when you need to recognize that the question isn't going to lead to a, a new discovery of an answer that's going to be fulfilling, but it's just going to lead to far more questions and far more questions and far more questions. And it's going to take people out of the energy that they've already put into getting ready to go. And when you let the air out of that tire, it is so hard to reinflate it. And I see actors and directors and producers and writers doing it. And it's, it's, it's most often that little 12 year old insecurity that's causing it. They don't feel like they're being heard. They don't feel like they're being respected. They don't feel like they're being valued. And it's it's so unfortunate and it's such a waste of time. And if they could just recognize where that was coming from, uh, I think sets would operate in a far more efficient manner. And what about in the middle of shooting, what do you need in terms of feedback as it's happening? Uh, because you're so prepared, because you're so um, wired in, like, is there a certain approach that works better for you than others? I, it's funny, man. I have had the pleasure of working with some phenomenal directors. And I've also spent a great deal of my career working with gun for hire directors that are hired to do an episode of this or an episode of that. And, and that's not to be disparaging and say that they're not incredible directors, but I've spent, I've done quite a number of projects where I wasn't informed really in any way at all by the director on the project. Um, the, 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 uh, there have been times where it's like, oh my God, thank God so-and-so was directing. Other, uh, what they got out of me or the point of view that they illuminated for me, I just, I wouldn't have seen it that way. And, and wow, like I, I'm just so grateful. Uh, I, I can't say that, I mean, it would be great if, if every job I had a director that recognized the the key elements of what it was that they wanted to do and how they wanted to communicate to an actor and what the exact vision was for what they wanted to produce on the screen. That would be remarkable. It would take so much of the onus off off my shoulders, but that's just not not the way it often happens. You know, many times I'm I'm working with uh, young or inexperienced directors and and, and that, there's nothing wrong with that. There, that there's the, the collaboration can actually be quite, really quite thrilling in those instances where they'll say, you know, I'm not sure here, what do you think? And and I did an indie film recently with a young director who, who def, you know, not not inexperienced, but has, has made a couple of films. I loved working with him. Um, there, was a, there was a flexibility and a, um, a genial nature to the notion of discovery, not only within the piece, but discovering things about himself as a director. And and I, I don't, I, I never fault anybody for for learning who they are as they go, because it wasn't that he was uh, learning by virtue of the fact that he didn't do his homework. He was learning because there's only so much that he can lear have learned up until this point. <laughs> yeah. um, but it was, but it was, it was really, uh, it was a, quite a terrific experience. I worked with Ross and Thurber on uh, Red Notice. And, you know, he, he, uh, he's a contemporary of mine in terms of we're, we're the same age. Um, and I was just so blown away by his, um, first of all, he's exceptionally bright and he's a massive cinephile. And he loves actors, I think because he was an actor. You know, there is something great about working with a director that loves actors. And, and they don't all love actors and, and that's mm -hmm. okay too. You know what I mean? That, 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 that's fine. But as an actor, it's really nice to feel 
like you're wanted there and like maybe, uh, you know, the notion that an, a good idea can come from from a number of different places. And Rawson is def definitely that collaborative spirit. What I loved about working with him was that he's fully prepared. He, he's, he has known what the story, what the visual, he, he knows you know, shot by shot what the film is going to be. And yet, when something happens on set, as was bound to happen when you got Ryan Reynolds, the improv improvisational genius, throwing these phenomenal one-liners that can take the scene in just this slightly different tone, yeah. you know, Rawson wasn't rigid about any of it. It was like, yes, follow the spark. Uh, and, and there's just something really, really lovely about that. And then when there was something in a scene that didn't feel like it was necessarily going in a way that felt like it was fulfilling the scene the right way, Rawson had the answer because he'd already sort of seen what the scene needed to be. I, I'm really excited to see what happens in his career. It, typically, you know, a director can either be, you know, really, really powerful visually or really, really powerful um, understanding the pros or really, really powerful understanding the actors. It's it's so rare that they can that they can possess all of those elements and, and, and put them into action. And I think I think, uh, you know, I, I think we're going to see some pretty great things from Rawson. Um, uh, what I hope for the most when I'm meeting a director or working with a director is that if they have a super clear vision and they are and they're rigid in what they want that they can communicate that to me i'm happy to give that if they are flexible and free uh, i i want to know that that i can collaborate with them unselfconsciously and try something that doesn't work that's fine we'll try you know we'll try and find something that does work it's really you know it's the same way with writers there are certain writers um I worked with David Crane. I did a show called Episodes. And that show, when I watched it, I was a fan of the show before I did it, I thought the whole thing was improvised because it was so free. And, yeah. and, 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 and the way that they wrote for Matt LeBlanc, I thought for certain that was improvised. Yeah, but, yeah. but it was, everything was scripted down to the guttural noises, down to the, you know, if it was a chuckle in the script, they would say, ha ha. And the character, the actor would say, ha ha. I mean, it was scripted to the T. And I have to say, there was no other way to perform it because when I got my material, you didn't want to change a single comma. Wow. It was, it was just exactly right. And then there are, there are other, you know, there are other gigs. I worked with Pete and Bob Farrelly and, and they're like, let's try it. You know, let's see what works, you know? And, and, and that notion of, I don't know, come on, Mo, what are you going to do? Oh, well, let's go over here. See what you're going to do over here, and then, and that's beautiful too, because it's like, well, this is what it says on the page, but here we are on set now, and yeah, on the page it says the ladder's over there, but because the camera's got to be this way, because the sun is over there, the ladder's over there. So what if we try blah 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 blah? Oh yeah, that's even funnier. And then maybe he can say blah blah blah, and da, da, da. and all of a sudden you got this new scene that's got brand new life in it, and and it's exciting to do. You just mentioned three projects that you were involved with that land on different levels when it comes to budget. I'm just wondering how that factors in to your work and your preparation and your worries and what you have to deal with knowing that going in. It's it's a matter of knowing it's a matter of knowing what it is, right? So I my my level of expectation okay. The truth of the matter is when I'm very lucid, when I remember to take a deep breath before getting in my car in the morning before going to set, when I Remember to put my feet on the ground and say, hey, you get to put costumes on for a living and you get to entertain people with stories and character. When I remember to just take that moment of real gratitude, then I really don't have expectation. And, and I, can, I can go into a $200 million budget like Red Notice and when they're like, you know, when they say, we're so sorry, it's gonna be a 12 hour delay because of blank, or your trailer doesn't have air conditioning today, Chris, this is mortifying, we don't know what's going on, we're gonna try and move you to another trailer, but it's a full set today, or whatever the hell it is, right? It doesn't. When I remember that all of this is gravy, because this is what I get to do for a living, none of that matters. It doesn't matter any less than when I go on to a $250,000 set, and there is no trailer, and I, I have to, you know, ask at the pizzeria if I can use the bathroom before we shoot. <laughs> it, you know, it, it is, it's very, it's very philosophical in practice, right? But we're as wealthy or as poor 
as we decide to be based on what our needs and expectations are. And in this business, actors can help themselves so much by by letting go of that. I mean, it's not linear. You know, there's no destination. I, I truly hope and wonder if I'll ever work again after I do a job. I often think it while I'm doing a job. <laughs> Is there going to be another job? And it's not, that's not fake, you know, humble pie. No, it's a real thought. And it's a multifaceted thought. It's practical. I have three children and I need to support my family. It's creative. I love doing this. I don't want this to end. I'm only on this for three days. I need more. It's fantastical. Man, I have been doing this so long. I learned so much. Who knows what the next one will be? What? What? Where can it take me? It's all of these things. And and when I when I can just sort of go, when I can remind myself that the very same instability and variable ridden nature that permeates this industry is the very fabric of the universe itself, then I've got nothing to worry about and I've got everything to worry about, right? I, we're all hurtling toward death so yeah. we can either yes. we can either live that every moment or we can right. okay this is pretty great right now i'm i'm i get to do this because i made the decision to do the project weeks and weeks ago right chris there's this project it's shooting here this is the budget this is the character this is how long you're going to be shooting this is what they want you to do this is what you're going to be paid what do you think and then, and then, you know, we go through the, you know, the Michael Caine rule of three, right? You know that one, right? Yes, yes. So, and, and, and just, you know, any time I, I don't have two of the three, there will be some suffering. I, the, so the gratitude can wane and, and the expectation comes into play and the insecurity sneaks in. And, and I go, God damn it. It's so simple. It's so simple. I didn't listen to a very, very good bit of advice, but it happens. <laughs> I think I just missed you in Waitress on Broadway. I think when I saw it, you had just finished your run. How did that come about? I was meant to do the show originally, to open it on Broadway. I did the workshop, and I was supposed to do it, but I, uh, there was a series that I was doing for Amazon that ended up pushing, and I couldn't I couldn't do the Broadway oh. show. And, and so when Sarah Bareilles decided to go into the show... They were nice enough to reach out to me and say, look, oh, that's so you know, Sarah would love to do it with you. Would you like to do it? And I, I jumped at the opportunity. I've just, I've been such a huge fan of hers forever. And um, it was such a beautiful experience. Um, and it was such a well-crafted show. And, and Diane Paulus, the director, is just so, oh, she's just so lovely and so intelligent and such an actor's director. And uh, it was just a blissful experience for me. What was that like going back on the stage after so long? Exceptionally fucking challenging because <laughs> I had taken a 15 year hiatus and particularly in musicals, you know, I, I don't think that this is tried and true. And there are a lot of actors that are going to say, oh, you're such a wimp. But I do believe for me that 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 a a a big singing role show is like something that a, like a young single guy does. <laughs> or someone whose kids have gone off to college or a little older. I had th I had two small children no, at the time. And so I would wake up at 5 a.m. and they wow. want me to do characters and voices for them. Then I'd walk them to school in the cold air. And then I'd have to go to my matinee. And there's all this talking. And you've only got a certain amount of vocal. I mean, unless you're oh, Chris Fitzgerald, who was in the show with me. And this, that guy's got chords of plutonium like I don't understand how he has the, the vocal capacity that he has he just he's like the Energizer Bunny exceptionally talented and his voice just never quits but for me I'm talking at 5 a.m. I'm doing a matinee then I'm rushing home to tuck them in give them a kiss and then I'm going to the evening show by the time Sunday hits and here was the challenge Sunday hits and then we've got Monday off but Monday is when I have to do Mickey Mouse and I've got to do Centaur World oh, and I've got God. to do all my other animation and then I start the week again. And I'm proud to say that in my tenure on Waitress, after a 15-year hiatus, I was the only cast member that didn't miss a single show. Wow. Because I willed it to happen. I was like, I am not missing a show. These producers are paying me. Yeah. I am doing this show. 
I'm making it happen. And I didn't go out. I mean, I was, other than being with my children and being present with my family, I was a monk. I didn't go out for drinks with the cast, much to my chagrin. I would have loved to. That was yeah. half of the fun when I was on Broadway before yeah, I yeah. was married with children. But no, man, with, uh, with, with the family, it's like, oof, I had to live like a monk. So it was fun to do, but uh, take me back to the movies for a while, will you? Just waking up at 5 a.m. in general, but after having done a show. Yeah, it was a lot, man. <laughs> Come it on. It was a lot. Yeah, and then they're like, you know, like, Dad, do, do that voice or read the story like that. No, you have to sound like that guy. And it's like, okay, here we go. But I have to sing pretty. Sarah Bareilles is a pop star. And we're singing duets together. Oh, man. I had I made the mistake of introducing my kids to the court jester. And oh. that was my first Danny Kaye movie, which I love yeah. more than anything. But my day would begin with my daughter saying, please sing the song. And I would have to go. When I was a lad, I was gloomy and sad as I was from the day I was born. When other lads giggled and gurgled and wiggled, I proudly was loudly forlorn. My friends and my family looked at me glamily, thought there was something amiss. When others found various antics hilarious, all I could manage was this or this, or this, or this. <laughs> my father, he shouted, he needs to be glad to see on a wreath, I'll hand them. My mother, she cried, she rushed to my side, you're a brute and you don't understand him. So they sent for a witch with a terrible twitch to ask her my future and pressed her. She took one look at me and cried, he, 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 what else could he be but a jester? A jester? A jester? A funny idea, a jester. No butcher, no bacon, no candlestick maker, and me with the look of a fine undertaker impressed her as a jester. Anyway, I had to do that every day no. before the show began. What's amazing is that I could see uh, Danny Kay in your face. Ha <laughs> there you as go. As you're doing it. <laughs> and you know what you're doing. You're, you're building an actress there. Are you, are you worried about that? <laughs> you know, it's really interesting, man. I, my wife and I, who, who my wife is also a phenomenal actor, and uh, it didn't dawn on us until recently what an odd existence these kids must be having. And we've got three now. And just how strange it must be to come into my studio, and I'm like, here, guys, take a look at this. I'm not sure if this voice, I'm doing Darkwing Duck. Does this sound good? And my son's like, nah, I don't buy it. It's got to be more more Gene Wilder. And it's like, Ugh, okay, well, you know, whatever it is, right? And 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 just the notion that that they're growing up in this sort of strange creative space. I mean, it's nothing like either of us, my, my wife or I grew up. Uh, so I don't know, is it building an actor or is it building someone that's seeing so far behind the curtain that they are fascinated by, as my daughter is, by ocean biomes instead? Mm, you never know, yes. you never know. I just, it, it, it's the same thing, whether it's acting or, or uh, you know, marine biology, follow the spark. That's what that's that that's that's the mantra at home. Follow the spark. What are you curious about? What are you mm -hmm. curious about? If you're curious about it, it's it's it, it, it's going to lead you somewhere. So you know, as long as you're being kind, follow the spark. You do the voice of Mickey Mouse, and like people might not realize this, there's been like five people that have ever officially done the voice of Mickey Mouse, and You've been doing this now for, for years, right? Yeah, it's been uh, since 2012, 2013, yeah. So I think that the thing that I'm thinking about is like, is there is there a certain aspect of this that people may not realize, which is that this is, a, this is another character. Like, like, I don't know if we're thinking about it like that. It's, it's so iconic and the voice is so particular, but you have to act this. Like, this is like, like so, it, it seems no, like. No, 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 but you, you hit the nail on the head. And, and, and this is why when they, when they cast the net to find a, a, a new Mickey, it wasn't to find a new Mickey Mouse voice because they had a, a Mickey Mouse voice and they have a Mickey Mouse voice. And, 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 and it's the fellow that does the, uh, the Mickey Mouse Clubhouse, the, the preschool stuff, and 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 the, 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 the Disney has the, the corporate mascot Mickey. It's Paul Rudish and his team at Disney wanted to pay homage to the original Walt Mickey shorts and to find a way to bring the rapscallion Mickey, the original Mickey that f that we first saw in in shorts like the the Brave Little Tailor, you know. They were here, there, everywhere, a whole bunch of them. I was surrounded. You know, it's this notion of Mickey was Errol Flynn, but he could also be Humphrey Bogart, and he could also be Indiana Jones, and he could also be Mo. You know what I mean? Like Mickey was our everyman. He was Jimmy Stewart uh, with a falsetto. And so they really wanted to find an actor to embody 
Mickey Mouse in his adventures where, where, where he's pushing the envelope of who he is. Mickey Mouse singing. I mean, we did, we released this beautiful, never before seen ride, a Disney World ride called Mickey's Railway, which is just spectacular with this beautiful song. And um, no, when, when the audition came to me, I was reticent to, to do it because I just, I just figured anyone that's gonna do this, they, I mean, they gotta, they gotta have known that they can do Mickey and I'd never tried before. But I, I, it was really kismet actually, because there was it was around the time that um, uh, what was that Tom Hanks movie where he where he and Emma Thompson uh, it was it was that that what was it Finding Mr. Yeah, Banks Saving Mr. Banks or something like that that's or, it yeah that's it and and so by virtue of the fact that that movie was coming out there were all these Disney documentaries on TV at the time and before I made my decision as to whether or not I was going to audition there was one of these documentaries on and I saw Walt speaking with someone and his voice was very very similar in in timbre to mine and he was talking mm. and having the conversation and they asked him would you would you give us a little mickey and i saw what he did with his body when he went well oh boy and i realized that it wasn't coming like i said to you at the beginning of this conversation it wasn't really coming you know from the voice but it was sort of it was affected by so much else that was happening in the body and when i stopped and thought about it you know, Mickey is the everyman. Mickey is all of us. It, where his voice lies is sort of another story. But it's, you know, in in how does he service the adventure that that we're going to be seeing him in? And that became very exciting to me. And having just come off the Three Stooges, where I had sort of a, a real happy facility with that '30s vernacular, I really sort of wanted to try my my hand at it. And and it was exhilarating to go into the old animation building and and revoice the old Walt short and and lo and behold um, I I ended up getting the part and I have just I've had the most remarkable fun playing this character and you're absolutely right it it is a character it's a it's a, a, a one of the most fun acting gigs I've ever had in my life I wear it truly like a badge of honor do you have anything that you do when you're not working that kind of feeds your inner actor? I think that in order to feel fulfilled as an actor, you have to act, um, which is why I don't eschew or turn my nose at audition opportunities because sometimes for months on end, those are the only opportunities to act. And so what keeps me flexible in between gigs is maintaining my life so that when a gig pops up out of nowhere and I have to go to Australia for six months, I've done the emotional, physical, and mental work that's necessary to sustain that massive change. I keep myself healthy in the off chance that I'm going to get a role like Red Notice where they say, okay, great, you start in two weeks, you've got to be in the best shape in your life. Um, or, great, uh, that's great that you're in great shape. You've got three months to get in the worst shape of your life, right? But I keep myself at a place of healthy neutrality. I try to, you know, exercise, but not too much so that I'm, you know, lithe and strong, but not that the, my, my, my physicality isn't overpowering any opportunity for a role that maybe doesn't necessarily need to be, you know, s supremely physically fit, right? It's keeping myself at a level place of neutrality where I can embody a role at a given point. It's making sure that in my downtime, when I'm with my kids, I'm present with my kids. And uh, when I have time to just be home and, and be with my wife and be with the family, that I'm not giving in to that inner insecurity of fuck am i ever going to get hired again am i ever going to work again that instead what i'm what i what i do is recognize that all of that will take care of itself right now this is where i am and this is what i'm doing um, it's like i've used the analogy before it's like a lion in the prairie right it's like just sort of sitting there absorbing the sun and the tail occasionally wagging a fly off and everything is placid and just present until the gazelle is just, you know, off the horizon over there. And then every single muscle, all the sinew, every synapse is ignited and 
there's no holding back. Christy Amantopoulos, thank you so much. Please come back on the show. It would be my pleasure. I, 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 I think this is an incredible tool for uh, young actors, old actors, directors, writers. What a great opportunity to be able to talk about something like this. And, you know, I, a conversation this long about me or what I do can feel self-indulgent. But given that this is the actual framework of it, it eliminates that feeling and really sort of allows me to, to look at it, you know, honestly and realistically. And, uh, and, and you, you have an engaging presence. Um, so I, I, really, I really enjoyed this. I'm happy to come back. Back to One is a production of Filmmaker Magazine, which is a publication of The Gotham, formerly IFP. Listen to back episodes of this podcast at filmmakermagazine.com or wherever you get your podcasts.